Okay, well, <clears throat> we had a really nice, I don't know if anyone had it like a, a burning um, question, but we had a really, I wanted to go through, we had a really nice reading um, yesterday and from Divine Guidance. And just re some really, really nice points that Gurudev made. And I wanted to, um, to review that. And then also Suvasniji had a request. Um, but maybe before I go to that, does anyone have something in particular that they, they really wanted to discuss today? We can, we can go to that. Dandavat, Didi. I was just wondering if you could give like a tiny um, synopsis of your Guru Day, your beloved Srila Guru Day, for those of us newcomers here who are unfamiliar. Oh, yeah. Okay. Hello. You have a new, a new friend with you today. Who is this? My name is Varun. Uh, Varun, so okay. Uh, so I'm here with oh, Chintamani. Okay, great. Oh dear, the internet is, I don't know if it's your internet or my internet. Arizona. Okay, I think yeah, we're back. The internet first, uh, one is a bit my... funny. Mm. Uh, okay, hear me? Good, and more are coming here from Divine Grace Yoga Ashram. So uh, thanks for having us. Can you hear us? I can hear you now. You, you cut out. I don't know if it was just me. Yes, um, but, uh, sorry. Uh, so yeah, this is my first experience with uh, with this practice. Okay, with the practice of Krishna consciousness. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Right. Okay. Okay. Um, so so um so Chintamani, what was it that you said? I forget. You tell said us a little bit. I uh, just before you read something from Sri the Guru Dave, could you just give a little tiny like uh, background information? That's it. Just a okay it's all up so we're all up to speed <laughs> okay sure no but i wasn't i thought you might have said particularly about gurudev but you meant more generally about yeah Krishna. about gurudev yeah so something particularly about our gurudev yeah why like how he's special and that, like bhakti and you know in this line and just something general okay if if you like Okay. So I, so I have seen the documentary. You've seen a documentary? About uh, uh, Sri Prabhupati. About who? Is it Prabhupada. About Srila Swami Maharaj Prabhupada. Yeah, it's, okay. it's been, no, I think it came out last year or this year. Oh, okay, okay, okay. I, I think I'm with you now. Okay, so you're, so you're totally new to Krishna consciousness. But which, yeah. which tradition have you been following? Um, it's right now. It's the I'm at the Shivananda ashram. It's a Shivananda, okay. a Shivananda tradition. But I've also done, you know, uh, Zen, uh, Soto Zen, and and Kriya and Kriya Yoga. Okay. 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 Yes. Yes. Of course. I I was just I was wasn't quite sure where you were coming from. Yeah, um, so but, really, I don't really I, have a practice though. So okay, yeah. okay, all right. Well, yes, of course, we're happy to try to give some, some, you know, summary overview of what we're about. Um, and in just we can say, well, you have some familiarity with the with the Vedas, with the teachings of the Vedas, um, and as you are no doubt aware, they are very very broad. Um, you know, people who don't know, they use the word Hindu as like a, like one label to put on anyone who's following an, an Indian path. But actually, you know, it, there, there's an expression in, in Bengal, yatamat tatapat, you know, what, what, you, what, you, what you think, that's your path. <laughs> what you believe, that's your path. <laughs> that's the way. And uh, Mark, Mark Twain, the writer Mark Twain, had a very nice comment that he said, when it comes to religion, India is the millionaire. <laughs> because the Vedas are so broad and there's so many different paths and goals of life and practices which are advocated there. And the reason for, and you know, they, they contradict themselves, you know, to that point. And the reason for that is that the Vedas are throwing a very broad net 
and they're trying to give the, you know, at their, at their lowest level of realization, at the lowest level of realization that they're trying to give, they're just trying to help people live a decent life, you know, without murdering each other. <laughs> that, that, that's like the lowest level instruction. And then, and then at, the, at the other end of the spectrum, the most refined teachings, then it is, a, it is, the, it is divine love, you know, service and dedication in divine love for the supreme absolute truth. So, so everything is there. So many paths are presented just so that everyone, no matter what background, what level of understanding they have, they, everyone can get some foot on the ladder. That's, the, that's kind of like the big, the grand master plan that is presented in the, in the Vedic instruction. And in, in gist, we can say that there are, um, one way that our grandfather, Guru Shila Shidamar, he, he presented this, which is a helpful way to approach it, is to analyze the, the motives of life in terms of the spirit of exploitation, the spirit of enjoyment, um, then second, the spirit of renunciation, of, of abnegation, and then third, the spirit of, of dedication. You know, we can say that everything in this world is done in these, on, on the basis of these three motives. And so the Vedic instruction, it is also giving different levels of teachings according to persons who, who fall, who, you know, who can follow um, you know, one of these three strains of life. And, and so, the, so, uh, so the first one that I mentioned is uh, the spirit of exploitation. And generally, this is the most pervasive spirit in this world. You know, it is a world of selfishness. You know, this is why we face so many problems in the world today, you know, because there, it is so pervaded by by selfishness. And this is, and this is, you know, one of the reasons why what we're trying to do is so fundamentally important because, you know, we can run around trying to cure the symptoms of a problem, but until we can get to the root of a problem, then it will continue again and again. You know? So there are many philanthropic works that persons can carry out in this world, which is of course, a, a fine and noble thing, but unless you can get to the root of the problem, it, the same problems will come up again and again. And the root of that is selfishness. So selfishness, exploitation, this is predominantly a world of, of that mood. Um, and then the, then the second class that I mentioned is the spirit of renunciation. And so, you know, there, there is the, for those who are a little more sober, a little more, you know, intelligent, then they see that all exploitation, all enjoyment, it has a negative reaction. It, it, it comes back at you like a boomerang. Whatever we take for ourselves, there is an equal and opposite reaction for that. And that is, that is karma, of course, which everybody is is familiar with. And so, so in, in terms of the first um, category I mentioned, the spirit of exploitation, then you find sections of the Vedas, you know, which are directed at persons who are very, very fixed in that approach to life. And so rather than just telling them to completely give up the spirit of selfishness and exploitation, they're trying to modify trying to, to, um, to uh, you know, handle it, handle that spirit so that it doesn't get too out of hand, you know. So the Vedas are accommodating that spirit and trying to like keep it under control, you know. So, so you, know, and, you know, like to, to enjoy, but in a regulated way. And so you find sections of the Vedas which are giving allowance for 
a life of selfish enjoyment and self-seeking, but in a controlled way and in a regulated way under the under the the you know following the worship of of different deities um you know following a regulated and you know pious religious life you know um so for example just as a very basic example um you know someone is is um someone is attached to sex life then get married to one person keep it controlled you know don't live in a wild way you know every going everywhere and anywhere you know and try to keep the focus on raising children and raising your children um, with the mood of trying to do good for the environment you know like like this this is just a simple example and and cultivating a mood of of um dependence upon higher deities and living living in, in harmony with the environment. So there is taking for oneself, but there's also giving back to the environment. And there's a spirit of trying to live in adherence to, to you know, higher deities and the higher plane. So this is um, you know, what we call karma kanda. There's this is one section of the Vedas accommodating these kinds of persons who are not ready to give up the spirit of enjoyment. So then, then, then for the second class of persons who are, let's say, you know, a little more realized, a little more developed, they see that, as I mentioned, everything that we take for ourselves in this world, it has some negative reaction attached to it. You know, anything that we do in the spirit of independence necessarily invites a reaction. So, you know, you know, I'm, I'm taking this energy for myself, but I will have to give it back later. You know, it is, it is like that. You know, the, um, the Sanskrit word for, for meat is very interesting. Mamsa, which means me, he. <laughs> The, the, the idea being that now I am eating you, but later you will eat me. <laughs> so, so these persons, they, they, they have that, that, that broader vision that everything, has a neg everything I do for myself, it has some negative reaction. And then another important point, more fundamentally speaking, in the first place, I am a spirit soul. I am not this body. No, I am not this body of flesh and blood, and this is not my only life. So therefore, why should I give my energy to trying to enjoy the pleasures of this body and, and, this, and all the paraphernalia that is associated with this body and all of the objects of the senses which my body currently finds so enjoyable? Why should I spend my time and energy chasing after that? You know, what's the point? I'm a spirit soul. The soul, spirit, has nothing to do with matter. So then doesn't it make more sense, you know, number one, to become free of my attachment to material enjoyment, and two, to realize the true self within, to realize my true nature as a spirit soul. So then for these persons, the mood of renunciation is very prominent. And so there are many, there, then there are, for those persons who are ready for that level of understanding, there are paths in the Ved, given in the Vedas, which are encouraging that mood. The, the Vedanta Sutra, which you may be aware of, this was the penultimate work that was prepared by the sage, the great sage who compiled and organized all of the Vedic literature, Krishna, Dvaipai, and Veda Vyas. The Vedanta Sutra was, the, was his penultimate work. And, and, and so it is a very, Vedanta literally means the end of the Veda. So it is like a concluding text of the Veda, like a final word. And so the, the beginning, the very first expression in that Vedanta Sutra is very famous, Atato Brahma Jigyasa. 
means now search after spirit. No. Now, now, now that you've finished your, your, your life in the world of, of material enjoyment, now get, it out, get a promotion, go up, go a step further. Now search after spirit. Now give you finished your course in the world of worldly enjoyment, in the world of matter. Now give that up. Now search after spirit, renounce that world and search after spirit, Atato Brahma Jigyasa. So, so this, this mood, um, as I said, is very predominant for those in that world of consciousness, the spirit of renunciation and, and, and seeking after spirit over matter. And there are many paths, you know, Buddhism, you know, beyond the Vedic. Um, I mean, what I just mentioned, these three classes, exploitation, renunciation, dedication, they don't only per pertain to the Vedic, the Vedic instruction, but all paths in this world, they can go into any of these categories. So for example, Buddhism, you know, th that also falls into this category of promoting the, the spirit of renunciation from this world. And, and it, is a, it is something that is easy for persons to understand. And that is why paths which are advocating that mood, they will always be more popular and more easy for persons to understand than what we are doing, you know, by, by contrast, which I'm getting to. Um, because it's, it's simple to understand. We can see this is a world of suffering we can see that enjoyment, desire, attachment, they bring problems. So it's very simple to say, give it all up. You know, just give it all up. And it is, it is easy to understand. Um, so, so, so exploitation, renunciation, and then third category, that is the plane of dedication. You know, and, that, and the Vaishnava school, you know, that, that which we are trying to follow, they, they are in that group. We identify with that group. And the consideration there is that both of the other two mentalities are, are unnatural. They're abnormal. The true nature of the soul is to give, to serve, to love. You know, it, is, it is not actually enjoyment, which is the problem but it is selfish enjoyment. It is material enjoyment, which is the problem. It is not that attachment is the problem. Attachment, feeling, love, desire, all of these things, they are not the problem. The problem occurs when they are misdirected, when they are, they are expressed in a perverted and a confused way. You know? So the, the soul by nature wants to express all of these things, but in the conditioned state, and by conditioned, I mean when we are living in the state of being covered by the material energy, then, then the desires of our soul, they're being expressed through the filters of our material body. You know, and, and by material body, I don't just mean the physical body, but I mean also the subtle aspect of our material body, which means the mind, the senses, the false ego. So in a very insidious, so our material existence exists in a very insidious way because there is the gross aspect and also the subtle aspect. So, so the desires of the soul, which are normal and healthy, they're coming out through these perverted filters and they're being directed upon the, the objects and the, the ideas, the concepts of this worldly plane. So the idea of the bhakti school, the Vaishnava school, the, the world of dedication, the idea is the understanding is that, that you know, the, 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 the healthy soul, the realized soul naturally wants to serve and love um, in connection with our loving Lord. You know, there is, and this is another important point, that there is a, that, that the absolute is not only formless, 
but the absolute has a personal expression also. The, uh, this, this is another um, point of difference between um, many schools who advocate the path of renunciation because their thinking is that, that we see this world of variety is a mortal world. This world of, of, of feeling, of love, of emotion, of attachment, of variety, of dynamic movement, we see that it is also a mortal world. And so they equate these two things, that variety equals mortality, equals temporality. And therefore that which is eternal must be formless, must be non-differentiated. Um, so, so, um, so, you know, in the, in the Vedic line, the person speak about the Brahman, right? This great formless, non-differentiated spiritual existence. And the goal is to merge into that, you know, Buddhism speaks about Nirvana, right? Whereas the, the, there is the recognition that the absolute can also take on a personal expression. Why not? Why does variety have to equal mortality? Why can there not be a dynamic spiritual plane? Yes, there is a dynamic material plane, but why can there not be a dynamic spiritual plane? If anything, it must be so because, because that, you know, where there is variety, variegatedness, movement, color, life, you know, that is, that is something that is more sophisticated than just a blank sheet. So how could our source be something less sophisticated than ourselves? How could the highest goal be something less developed and less sophisticated than our own self? It doesn't make sense. You know, if, if we, you know, we are such complex, sophisticated, developed beings capable of such fine and intricate, um, you know, activity, understanding, et cetera, et cetera. Our source must be more refined, more conscious, more complex, more sophisticated than we ourselves. So this is, so this is, you know, welcome to the dynamic absolute. Welcome to the, the you know, the world of spiritual variegated, a spiritual variety, a personal absolute. So, so then the Vaishnava school, there are, there are also, you know, many different, you know, there's categories and there's subcategories. So within the Vaishnava school, there are also, you know, many different ideas, different conceptions, different different conceptions of the highest personal absolute. And, and we, we worship Krishna and we, we identify Krishna as the highest um, and most original expression of, of the absolute, personal absolute. <clears throat> so this is, the, this is the basic idea that our true nature is to be a loving servant and to reciprocate in a personal personal relationship with the personal entity of the absolute. And um, actually, Suvasniji, she was asking if I could explain one verse um, in Srimad Bhagavatam, which is also relevant to our discussion this evening, um, which explains, you know, how you know, with this consciousness of aspiring to be a loving servant and reciprocating in a relationship with the Supreme Lord, you know, how will we move in this world? You know, we're not rejecting this. We're not trying to exploit this world, nor are we trying to renounce this world. So how will we, how will we interact with the environment around us? Um, and, and so there's a very, this verse is very helpful, very nice, and it describes how we will try to dedicate all of our activities to the center, you know, with just some shift in consciousness. And, and this also is related to what I was mentioning at the beginning, 
no, no, how can we not feel some responsibility for all of the trouble in this world? You know, how can we account for not giving our energy to saving the trees or saving the oceans, et cetera, et cetera? Know, or you know, joining Greenpeace. Why are we not doing that? Or people starving in Africa, you know, et cetera, et cetera. How can we justify doing what we're doing? That is also explained in this verse. Yatatur mulani shechenene tripyanti at skandu gujopa shakaha pranopahara chayatendrianam the taiva savarhanam achuteja. And this very nice example is given of a tree that if we you know if a tree is lacking in water then we will put water at the root of the tree you know, we will not go to water the leaves the branches the flowers but we will go to water the root of the tree and from the roots that water will spread and nourish the entire tree and and also if we if we are hungry or we're weak or lacking in nourishment ourselves, then we will put food into our mouth where from there we'll go to our stomach. And from the stomach, the nutrients will spread throughout the body. You know, we won't go to put food in the ear or the eye or the nose or anywhere else, you know, but there's a, there's a system. <laughs> so similarly, the idea is that, that if we will try to give our attention to the root, of existence to the center means to the Lord who is the, the root of everything. Then we, if we give if we can give all of our energy to that center, then from that center our energy can be evenly distributed to all. You know, this is the idea in, in Krishna consciousness, you know, that we don't need to run this way or that way, here, there, A, B, C, D. You know, we, we, you know, we cannot do that anyway. You know? So this is actually the most efficient use of our energy, the most efficient way to give the most to all by trying to give our energy towards the center. So this is, this is you know, in just the conception of, of bhakti. It is, it is the most harmonious way to live, you know, to take something for ourself and also to reject something. They are both, they're both abnormal. You know? So Krishna consciousness, it is about proper, you know, one, this was one expression of one of our gurus, religion is proper adjustment. So the path of bhakti actually means seeing things in their proper place. I, I was thinking the other day, um, Sambandha Gyan, this, this is a very important phrase, Sambandha Gyan, literally it means like relationship and it means like seeing everything in its proper relationship. It means seeing everything, you know, in its proper place and understanding who we are what is the true nature of this world? What is the real goal of life? You know, th this is another important discussion. Um, these are three helpful phrases, Sambandha, Abhideya, Prayojana. We might have mentioned this last week, actually. Um, Sambandha, understanding how everything is properly situated, understanding our true nature, the true nature of the environment, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Pryojan means the goal of life, understanding what is the real goal of life. That is prema, Krishna prema, divine love for Krishna. Um, and then the third is abhideya, means understanding what is the path to that goal. And in the gist, that is bhakti, life of devotion. But what I was thinking about the other day is that one way in which we can understand Sambandha Gyan is context, <laughs> understanding the real context of things, understanding in what context the world is situated and what context we are situated, you know, seeing the, the big picture, not just seeing, you know, like with this pigeonhole view, 
you know, um, you know, how things are relating to us, but seeing the broader picture of things, how, what is the real connection? What is the real basis on which everything is running in this world? And that through the knowledge given by by the, by the Vaishnava saints and knowledge given in the Vedic scriptures, we can understand that Krishna, the Supreme Lord, he is the real source and root of everything. That everything in its proper, you know, everything properly situated is moving towards him. This, the true purpose of this world is really for his cause. And it is only because we are in a confused state that we're relating everything to ourselves and our limited conceptions. So bhakti is really about seeing the environment as it truly is, seeing the real flow of things, seeing that, that everything actually is in connection with Krishna and is for, is in, is for Krishna's interest, and then simply trying to move in harmony with that. You know, we, we can think of bhakti as, as moving along with the stream, with the flowing stream, rather than trying to resist the natural flow. You know, you know this, this is why, this is the cause of karma when we are going against the natural flow of things. You know, the real current of the world is moving to towards Krishna and bhakti is simply about moving in harmony with that flow stepping out of our concocted you know egocentric existence and 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 recognizing the true flow of the environment and trying to move in in harmony with that flow And, and so then, in, then there is no karma. Karma means like the friction. <laughs> karma is the friction that, that takes place when you resist the currents. That's what karma is. <laughs> so then, um, um, so then, then, then the next question is why, why Krishna? <laughs> why is it all about Krishna? Why is Krishna number one? And the reason for that is that Krishna is the highest expression of love, you know, you know and, 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 and so, you know, the Vedas, they, as we mentioned, they are, they are extremely broad and really our understanding is that the Vedas are the source of all religious paths in this world. And that is why you can find something corresponding to the Vedas in every tradition in this world, because that is where they, they first originated from. Um, so the Vedas, they, 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 they describe different expressions of the absolute. They, they recognize the absolute is not limited to one form or expression. So, so in this way, you know, many, you know, opposing ideas in this world, they are all accommodated for very nicely in the Vedic teachings because they have the broadest vision on things. Um, so the Vedas, in, in terms of if we're speaking about the nature of the supreme being, the divine, the absolute, then the Vedas, they describe three principal manifestations. Um, um, Brahman, which we mentioned, um, describes an impersonal and formless aspect of the Lord uh, in which everything is contained, everything is floating within Brahman. And, 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 this, and this is, um, we could say, the most popular idea. Probably today, it is the most popular idea about divinity. It is, it is for some of the reasons for which we already mentioned. It's, it's an idea which people are very comfortable with, you know, you know because, because as, as I mentioned, you know, they, people see that this world is a, is a, it's a world of variety and form and color, movement, et cetera. And it's also a world of mortality and suffering. So it's easy to, to appreciate 
that the divine must be the exact opposite of that. The divine must be this great expansive formless consciousness, just must be this great spirit which is free of any form, which, which is seen as, as limiting things. Um, so this is the, this is the, the Brahman that is, that is recognized and described in the Vedas. And the Vedas themselves, for the most part, they are also mostly pointing in the direction of, of Brahman because it, it is the easiest idea for persons to, to understand. So, so this is one conception described. Um, and then next, Paramatta, and, and, and one characteristic of Brahman is that the Brahman is, is infinite, you know, the, and the root meaning of the very word Brahman is greater than the greatest and always becoming greater. So this is one, defi one defining characteristic of Brahman that is infinitely large. And then another expression of, of the absolute is paramatma. And uh, literally paramatma, everybody knows, atma means soul. And then para, para means great or supreme. So paramatma means the supreme soul. And this refers to a form that the absolute takes, which is extremely small and which, which sustains the existence of every individual living soul. So every, every individual atma is accompanied by paramatma. It is said paramatma lives in the heart of every living soul. Um, and, that, and that is a very small, very tiny expression of the absolute. So Brahman, Paramatma, and that Paramatma does not have person, so much personality. You know, Paramatma exists mostly as like a witness observing the activities of the living souls, you know, dispensing their karmic reactions and, and giving their life force. So the Paramatma, you can't, you know, you can't exactly have a relationship with Paramatma. And then third, third um, expression of the absolute that is described in the Vedas is Bhagavan. And literally the word Bhagavan means possessor of potency or opulence. And so Bhagavan is characterized by having a personality, you know, likes, dislikes, um, characteristics, you know. And, and so the, what is particular about the Bhagavan feature is that you can have a relationship with him. You, know, you can have a loving relationship with him. And so the Vaishnava school, you know, we worship the Bhagavan expression as the highest because we recognize love, affection, intimacy, to be the highest thing in existence. And this is how you could say we grade religious conceptions on the basis of how much closeness is available, you know, how much loving intimacy is available in this conception. So then also within the Bhagavan category, there, are, there is a gradation. No. And, you know, we can't, we're not going to go into that too much because there are so many different expressions of Bhagavan. You know, it, it is mentioned um, in the scriptures that as many waves as there are in the ocean, that's so many avatars of the Lord that there are. <laughs> and, and it is also mentioned that, that one reason that the Lord appears in so many different forms is in order to reciprocate with his devotees in the mood and the manner in which they hanker for, you know. So to sat, in other words, to please his devotees, to give them what they want, he appears in a suitable form, you know, to satisfy them. Um, so that there are there are many different um, forms of Bhagavan that the Lord takes, um, you know. Just as as one one example, you know, as a as a contrast to Krishna, 
there is Vishnu and Vishnu more or less corresponds with the Christian conception of, of God. You know, as I mentioned, we can find some origin for all religious ideas, you know, in the Vedas. So really Christians, they're there when they say God, they're talking about Vishnu. They just don't have too much information. They don't know his name, but the nature of Vishnu is the almighty creator, the protector. He's very, very majestic, very awe-inspiring. And, and, uh, and in this way corresponds with the Christian idea of God. Um, so then if we like, just kind of like fast forward, then, then we come to Krishna, um, who we recognize as being like the fountainhead of all expressions of divinity. Um, and, and why? Because Krishna, he is the most charming, he is the most loving, he is the most approachable. In Krishna, we find the closest approach of the finite to the infinite is made possible. The closest um, relationship, the most intimate relationship um, is made possible in connection with Krishna because their love reigns supreme. You know, love is the highest law there. To the extent that, that Krishna's devotees, they, they don't know that he's God. You know, they, they, you know, if they were too conscious of that, then it would, it would spoil, it would spoil the exchange of love, you know, because awe, reverence, these things, they, they put a damper on the exchange of love, you know. So, so there's an expression we use sometimes, jnana shunya bhakti, which means knowledge-free devotion. Devotion which is free from the knowledge that God is God. This is, this is what we recognize to be the highest type of love. And so there Krishna, his companions, you know, they, they relate with him in a very natural way, you know. As, as mother, father, friends, girlfriends, relatives, and so on and so forth. And, and the basis of everything is, is love and affection oh, above all else. Beauty over power. You know, beauty is the highest power. Beauty and love, they are the highest powers in this world. And that truth finds its full expression in Krishna's abode. It is a truth which we all, you know, there we find hints of that in our lives and in the world. You know, we see how beauty and love can conquer over everything else. But because it is a polluted world, because it is a confused world, that truth does not have its full flow and expression. And it is only in Krishna's abode where that, you know, where that, you know, has its, has its free flow and free play. You know, where, you know, that truth is held so supreme there, you know, that, that even Krishna, he is submitting himself to the love of his devotees. You know, he is, he is allowing himself to be controlled by the love of his devotees. And, and this, is, this is a significant point because, you know, persons, they, you know, we get a little, in, in, the, in the culture in which, you know, we've all been raised in this, like, you know, modern, Western, humanistic environment in which we've been raised, the idea of servitorship, it's, it's, uh, it's not a very savory <laughs> conception. You know, the, the idea that, you know, we're, we're all encouraged to think of ourselves as number one, right? You know, we're, we're all encouraged to, to enjoy for ourselves at the expense of others. We're encouraged to do things that put ourselves at the center. You know, this, this is something that, that, you know, is encouraged in our society. Mass, you know, we have MasterCard, right? So, you know, we're encouraged to think of ourselves as masters, as being in the center, you know, that our world is all in all. So the idea, so being told that your natural position is as a servant, not as a master, 
no, there, there's something that cringes when, when we hear that, you know. You know, there's something, there is this nice article of Saraswati Thakur where he, he, I think it was in the introduction to Brahma Samhita, there's this nice expression where he, he speaks about the uncomfortable feeling that arises when, when God is mentioned. <laughs> There's this uncomfortable feeling, you know. You know there, there's something in us which is uncomfortable with that with that idea, you know. That that you know th this is why you know atheism is so welcomed nowadays because if there's a God, that means we're not God. You know, it means we're not number one. You know? I thought I was God. I thought I was the center. I thought my whole life was. Supposed to, re I thought the world is supposed to revolve around me, and you're telling me that's not true. Like, what are you talking? Why are you bursting my bubble? Like, I don't want to hear this. No. <laughs> um. So, so you know, we're uncomfortable with that idea. No. But this is the other side of the coin. That if 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 someone can actually fully give themselves for the cause of, of the absolute, if someone can really embrace their natural position as a loving servant, then what's the other side of the coin? That he will also be compelled to become the servant of such a person. The you know, hambhakta pradino yasvatancha ivadvija. No, the Lord is confessing here. I have no independence. You know, I'm bound by the love of my devotees. <laughs> so if someone can really reach that point of realization, reach that point of surrender and self-giving, then the Lord, he will reciprocate in kind. You know, he will also give himself to, to such a soul. Um, okay, well, that's a, that's a short in, introduction. Dando si shaka didi, dando si everybody. Oh, Ramananda Prabhu, dando vats. Sorry, Johnny, late. Thank you. Great to see you, Prabhu, hope you're doing well. Thank you for explaining so nicely. Yeah, thank, thank you very you. much, that was very beautiful. Okay, I'm, I'm happy to hear that, I'm happy it was Makes helpful. It, yeah. That's it definitely it uh it resonates with me, so thank you. <laughs> and yeah, and uh, someone else has joined you there also, Jim Tanan. Yeah, it's a party. Uh, Parvati Devi. Parvati, okay, great, great, great to see you again. I just got a little tiny image on my screen, so I can't see very well. <laughs> Yes, thank you. Great to have you. Very again. inspiring and very aligned with the, everything that we're. Oh, that's wonderful to hear. Right now, so mm -hmm. very inspiring. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is what we've learned from our divine teachers, and we're we're happy if we can try to share something of that. Rukmini has also joined us again from Alachu, Florida, Dandavat. Nandavats, dear sister. Nandavats, do you have your 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 sons with you again today? No. <laughs> okay. <Yeah. laughs> and I see someone else. Is that I bet maybe Jayadev has joined us? There's an unidentified number. I think that's that's Jayadev. Unidentified Jayadev object. <laughs> Yeah, uh, beautifully said. The, the people at the ashram here, they've, they've had me be uh, giving uh, basic bhakti workshops. So they're okay. actually hearing all of, they're hearing all of these same things about, uh, you know, uh, Brahman, Paraman, Bhagavan, the three different modes, exploitation, renunciation. So, but it sounds so much nicer the way you say it than the way I say it. So I'm glad they're getting to hear it uh, more closely from the uh, horse's mouth. <laughs> Well, that's that's really nice to hear. You're, you've been doing bhakti workshop. That's that's awesome. Cool. <clears throat> Very nice. Um. Well, does anyone want to add anything? Jinmoy Prabhu, want to add anything? 
Does anybody else have some question or comment they'd like to make? Um, I I just like to ask something here. Seems how we're touching base on the the subject of of Brahman. Hmm. Um, I'm I'm quite familiar with the um, Advaita um, concept of Brahman and everything, but as I've delved into the Vaishnava philosophy, I've heard about Brahman as Ras, and that's kind of something that's harder for me to wrap my head around. Um, you you've heard about Brahman as Rasa. Yeah, that's right. Um, well, um, I mean, I, I can just share what I've what my understanding is. Um, that from our vision, the Brahman is is simply Krishna's effulgence. It is his divine effulgence. No doubt you're you're familiar with that. And his effulgence, it is also composed of, of, um, of, of atmas. It is composed of, of many individual souls. Um, yeah, I don't know if I could add anything more to that. Yeah, so I was I, just, I was reading a, um, a Shiksastikam um, commentary. And um, yeah, I was delving quite deep into the, the this uh, subject matter of Brahman being Ross and being, you know, not just like stagnant, but more animated. And, and not, not just what, sorry? Not just like, uh, like stagnant, you know, like that there was, there was animation to it and it, there's motion. Oh, I see. Well, definitely. Yes, for sure. Because I yeah. think the, the, the beta concept of, of Brahman, it sounds quite like um, kind of stagnant, right? Not a lot of movement. Stuff like yeah, 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 more or less. Yeah, I have something, Vishaka Didi. Um, sure. Yeah, I heard Param Guru Maharaj. Param Guru Maharaj said Brahman means like a, it's deep sleep. So they are kind of all the in Brahm Jyoti, they are kind of sleeping there. So eventually they wake up and then they go up or they go down. So it's kind of mm. a line. Yeah, that's what I my understanding from listening by Shila Guru Maharaj. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, I I think it depends on on. I mean, I mean, like one one nice way my Sudhamarsh put it was like, what was it exactly that he said? I can't remember. But but we can understand that persons are there for different reasons, and you know, there's different perspectives and angles on it. You know, so. So for one person, it may be a, um, you know, sleeping, but you know, there, there's, 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 a, let's just say there's a lot going on, <laughs> and there, there's many yeah, different that's, aim, there's many that's different That's what it aim. sounded like in this, in this, in this uh, commentary. Maybe I'll have to read, read more about it and try to study it a little bit more, and then maybe I can. Uh, Was that a commentary of Shil Swami Marsh Prabhupada? Um, no, it, it wasn't. It was from a, a disciple of um, Prabhupada, um, okay. Tripurari Swami. Uh-huh. Didi? Yes, yes, Prabhu. It could also depend upon the way he's using the word rasa. Is rasa just significant, uh, meaning a relationship, a type of relationship? Or is it meaning ecstasy? You know, how is that word being used? And in the Brahman conception, there's definitely ecstasy. If you did that type of connection, right. it's ecstatic. But what is the ultimate goal? Right. What is the ultimate relationship with that Brahma spirit? Right. Yeah. Yeah, we also hear about Brahmananda, you know, the, the, the pleasure the, that is derived from being in that, in that state of oh, right. and that, that could be called Brahma. Yeah, I, I mean, I mean, it's something that that we haven't, you know, it's not something that has been emphasized so much, you know, but, but um, I mean, I mean, like, see, one angle is that, that, um, yes, Brahman is nothing, but that's in comparison to Krishna, you know, because, you know, it, there, there is, there is an, a great high degree of, of uh, bliss that can be experienced in Brahman in comparison to our situation in this world, right. but in comparison 
to the pleasure, the bliss that is derived from bhakti, it is nothing, you know. So I mean, that, that's what I that's what I mean. Like there's there's different angles and perspectives on on, mm -hmm. on, the, on this thing, you know. Yeah, yeah. Man. So so like like for someone who's a who's a devotee of Krishna, like a real devotee of Krishna, then being merged in Brahman appears like hell. Right. <laughs> You know, that's from their angle of vision, you know. Right. But but for for someone in our situation, you know, that's a that's a very you know attract something very attractive. Yeah, I I see it as going from like, you know, the the negative one into the zero and then into the the plus one, you know, and from negative one zero looks looks quite appealing. Being, being from a, yeah, yeah, sure. And the plus yeah. one. Right. I mean, you know, what, what our gurus are giving us is so high that it's really difficult for us to, to, um, to get it, you know, because like we don't, we don't have any, we don't really have like a real, other than a, in a theoretical sense, we don't have any real reference point. You know? Right, yeah, no kidding. But, but like, um, like, 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 um, like, let's shift this a little bit, you know, there, there's, um, there's a verse of Raghunath Das Goswami where he's speaking about um, the different obstacles on the path. Um, and the first obstacle is the, is the mood of exploitation. Then the second obstacle is the, is the mood of renunciation, right? And, the, and these are the two obstacles Bukti and Mukti, right? These are the two things which we're most familiar of. But then Raghunath, he gives a, a third obstacle. And this is a more refined, this is for persons of a more refined understanding. The third, op the third obstacle for those on the, on the path of, of Ananya Bhakti, of, um, of uh, Raga Mark, who are following in the, in the line of of the Vrindavan mood of Prema Bhakti, then there's a third obstacle, and that is Aishwarja, the Aishwarja of Vaikuntha. Aishwarja means, means the spirit of opulence, grandeur, majesty. So right. that, 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 that is described as an obstacle. Right. What it's is, interesting what that is, that's described as an obstacle, though, because Madhurya sounds so much more attractive than, than Aishwarya. Um, well, it, it can be an obstacle. It can be an obstacle. Like trying to get past that Aishwarya mood? Yeah, I mean, that, that's something that can be very en entrancing. You know, that, uh, that, that's something that can be very, very attractive. You know? Right. I mean, you know, we're, as I said, our understanding is all theoretical and our, we don't really have real feeling at present. So, we can't really understand these things, but you know, let's say a million years from now we actually get to that point. You know, could we be distracted? <laughs> right. Could we? Right. Could we be enamored by that? You know. So 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 then so Bhakti you know, uh, Raghunath Das Goswami he wrote this verse, and then Bhakti Vinod you know, Thakur he wrote a Bengali poem elaborating on that verse. <laughs> and 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 he there's this one line there where where he says paravome deye fele where where he says that if you are if you are if so he says something like if you're such a fool as to be attracted by the vaikuntha mode of worship then paravome deye you'll be hurled down to that plane <laughs> oh wow like he says it's like it's this horrible punishment right you'll go even down <laughs> You'll be thrown down to Vaikuntha. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. So like that, that, that's what I'm trying to say. Like that's where our gurus are living, you know? Like we're here, it's we're so like- we, so incredibly we, we're, we're like, we're like living in the mud, right? And our gurus are like, like so many millions and billions of light years away from us. You know? <laughs> and, and from there, they're giving this super high angle of vision. <laughs> so, you know, like a lot of these things, we, you know, we're, we're like, we're honoring them, we're worshiping them, but we can't, 
we cannot fully understand them at present because and, and and we also have to be careful not to make offense, you know, because you know, like if I'm here like like talking like that, I'm just gonna make offense. <laughs> like like where I am and where by Kunta is many light years between. <laughs> yeah, if, if, if by Kunta is considered a well down, then why, where are we at? You know, what to speak of where we're at. Jeez. <laughs> So, you know, like a lot of these things, it's just kind of like we, we can't try to really understand them because we're, we're not there. We're not in a position to, to say such things. All we're doing is we're, it is important that we understand and refine our, our, our understanding of the ideal. You know, what, what is it that our gurus are trying to give us? What is their ideal of life? We're trying to understand that better. But we're not like identifying it as our own realization at present. You know, that's that's not possible. That would be imitation. But but we can we can happily and carefully, respectfully, you know, appreciate their vision sometimes. In fact, another expression of um, sorry, Sarasati Thakur. Sarasati Thakur, one of his expressions, Vrindavan is for shallow people. <laughs> but 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 Kurukshetra is the real place of Bhajan. <laughs> that, that, that's another one of those things, you know, that we we bow our heads to. <laughs> right. And Shilish, our our grandfather Guru Shilashudamar, she said when he heard that, and um, Sarasati Thakur mentioned this in a talk and Shila Sridhar he heard that and he said he felt he felt like he'd fallen out of a tree <laughs> when he heard that <laughs> you know so you know there's a particular context in which that expression has been made and and we you know we have to be careful with with many of these things you know we we are approaching we're approaching a very refined area and we, we don't want to be like like an elephant in a, in a tea shop you know make, making making havoc you know with our with our clumsy and awkward and and gross unrefined understanding you know? <laughs> yeah it's nice okay thank you it's, it's it's a bit of a relief to hear that you know to hear all this stuff it's like you know, this is a very high thing that, that we're aiming for. So. Yes. Very, very tiny, minuscule amount of progress that, that I've made. It's like it's humbling. It's nice. It's nice to hear. <laughs> yes. I mean, it's, it's difficult, really. It's, it's difficult sometimes to appreciate how high Krishna consciousness is because it's, it's too many levels beyond where we are at present. No, it, it, it's so many times removed from where we are at present. So, you know, it, it's it's easy to 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 lack appreciation for just how high and how refined it is. Yeah, right. No kidding. You can't even begin to fathom it at all. You have such a little conception. Of what? It is. Mm. <laughs> So Vasini Didi, you look like you want to say something. Please, please share something. <laughs> no, no, it's it's really, you know, yes, it is so high. It is whatever they have given us. Mm -hmm. You said very clearly, nicely. It is very difficult to even, you know, uh, imagine those high things, to appreciate that things, you know, mm -hmm. that is all. At least if we have a little appreciation of that, that will be our, uh, you know, good fortune to be able to appreciate that. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, um, should we conclude there for today? Does anyone else want to add anything, share anything, ask anything? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I would like to ask something, Shakadidi. Maybe you can elaborate a little bit. I heard uh, Param Guru Mai say that Shila Bhakti Siddhanta used to say towards the end, 
religion mean proper adjustment now and then religion mean proper adjustment could you oh you put yourself so so to say something about that expression yeah. Yeah. Because I listen to Param Kurma, he makes so simple, easy. But uh, I wish I could do like that. I have that anchoring. But uh, uh, Gurudev also tried, but I don't know. Gurudev didn't have uh, so good English. But I listened, I've been listening to Guru Maharaj, Gurudev, and uh, it's amazing, actually. He's talking mm -hmm. to different Vaishnavas, different devotees. So I feel so much inspired. But uh, there are so many points. So it's hard for me to what is relevant to me. So, so I've been here, I've been, I've been lucky actually, I got to serve Gurudev, so many great souls, so many Vaishnavas. So, so sometimes I feel I, I'm stuck, so which way I should go? <laughs> when I listen Guru Mahi, it inspires me, give me some vision, but uh, so it's, because uh, Guru Mahi say we are Rupa Nugas, aspiring Rupa Nugas. We don't go this line, that line, we are unalloyed, Follower of Srila Rupa Goswami. We trying to go that way. That's what my understanding is. <laughs> mm. I see Ananga Krishna Prabhu is showing, showing us his, his form along with his daughter. Hello, hola, como esta? Okay, and uh, we have a messenger from Varun and Parvati. Thank you for joining us. Very, very happy to have you with us. And thank you, thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you, you very so much. much. <laughs> very inspiring. Yeah. Um, see you next week. I'll try to, yeah, I'll try to see you next week, uh, wherever I am. That would be awesome. That would be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Nananda Krishna Prabhu. And, and I forget, what's your daughter's name again? Oh, I'm sorry. I was I was putting the TV volume down. She is to Devi. To Devi, that's right. Hola, to Devi. Como, como esta? <laughs> She's getting shy now. <laughs> great, great to have you with us, to Devi. <laughs> okay. Um. So religion is proper adjustment. Yes, we we heard from from Shula Shudamarsh that this was a favorite expression of, of Srila Saraswati Thakur um, in his last days. Um, and for, for myself, I, I see two, two ways of, of understanding this expression. Um, one, one in a more general and broad sense is seeing everything in connection with Krishna and according to its real place and, and interest. And then, and then also, um, in, in, you know, it, I feel like it's highlighting how our spiritual life practice development is something very dynamic. And that's, you know, the, you know this is kind of like, I, it, I see it as a, like a, a, living, a living description of what religion means a dynamic, a description of the dynamic nature of real religion, which is that in every time, place, and circumstance, we have to adjust ourselves in connection to the truth, with a capital T. We have to, and that means the teachings of, of, of guru, the teachings of Shastra, the scriptures, the Vaishnavas, you know, everything pertaining to the higher world, um, all the, you know, spiritual teachings, which we have, trying to adjust ourselves moment by moment in a dynamic and living way to, to that, you know, because we're in our condition, we're always in conflict. There's the lower pull, there's the pull to the lower side, all you know, which means the mass, the sum total of all of our material ideas, material attachments, material prejudice. There's that whole 
you know, black box of ego, as Shri Lashidamara has put it, which is pulling us on one side. And then on the other side, there's the sum total of everything that we've heard from sadhu, sadhu and shastra. So there's always this pull between these two sides going on. And the application of real religion is where we are at whatever point we are at to identify with the interest of the higher side and to act accordingly, to act in relationship to higher truth. This is religion, to act in accordance with higher truth, even at the expense of lower truth. So to adjust ourselves in relationship to the higher truth, that, that is religion. That is how I understand that. To adjust ourselves in connection to a Vaishnava. To adjust ourselves in connection to the Shastra. That is real religion. Um, and then in terms of, of um, your, you know, personal practice and life and attempt, you know, I mean, what can I say? Sometimes, you know, it's, it's okay to, it's okay to, it's okay to not always know exactly what's the right thing to do. <laughs> it's okay to not be okay. <laughs> And sometimes the best thing we can, if we're not sure, that's what I'm saying. You know, why, why do we have this attachment? And I speak for myself as well. Why do we always have this attachment to wanting to be sure all the time? You know, it's okay to be unsure. It's okay to not be okay. The worst thing we can do is to, is to like force something. You know, that if we think, oh, I've got to know exactly what I'm doing. I've got to take a definite path of approach. So I'm going to do this. To do that in an artificial way when we're not actually sure, that, that, that will be detrimental. It's okay to be in a state of uncertainty. It's actually healthy. It's healthy for us to be in a state of uncertainty. And, and you know, I, I'm speaking from what I've heard from our, from our you know, from superior Vaishnavas, and also what I've experienced in my own life, you know, in, in, um, in my own practice. I faced, I faced many periods of uncertainty. And, and it, it, I mean, I, I think it's something that is just very uncomfortable for us as limit, as, um, <clears throat> as, uh, as, as conditioned souls. You know, we, I, I actually had a very nice talk with them. Um, with my mother about this a little while ago. And she was just speaking about how we have this, we have this need to quantify everything. This is actually one meaning of the word Maya, measurement. We, we love to measure, to quantify. We like to have things under our control and, and we're uncomfortable with uncertainty. We're uncomfortable with that. So whenever we're in a state of uncertainty, we're always trying to, we're trying to find something that we can handle, something that we can grab, grab hold of. Oh, this is, this is, um, this is Divi, Divi Sharidi. What makes us uncomfortable is that we cannot qualify or quantify our journey. <laughs> no, we, we, we're not comfortable being in a state of uncertainty. But but what you know what what I've what I, you know from what I've understood and also what I've come to, I can't say I fully realized it yet. But I I feel more the need to accept this, and I see more and more, the, you know, the truth of this from my own experiences that that we have to embrace uncertainty. We have to be comfortable with that. That's actually part of surrender. We are like, like um, Shilu Shidamaraj says, we are hanging, actually this, this is the crooks of it. This is a beautiful quote in Loving Search for the Lost Servant. Um, Shilu Shidamaraj says, we are hanging from the upper world. 
you know, because we like to stand, we like to put our feet and stand on something, right? Yes, we feel very sure. You know, I have something under my feet. I know where I am, right? But, but the surrendered soul, as Shilu Shidamar says, is hanging from the upper world. Our, our support comes from above, not from below. And because it comes from above, it's beyond our comprehension, actually. It's beyond our comprehension. So there must be uncertainty there. <clears throat> so this is all just to say that, <clears throat> that you know, there will be periods in our life when we know what we're doing. You know, when, when like Gurudev told me to do this or this Vaishnava told me to do this or you know, everything in the environment is telling me this is the path. There will be periods like that. Yes, this is the way. I'm going this way with full convic conviction. There will be periods like that in our lives, but there will be other times when we're just not sure, when we're hanging, when we're uncertain, and that's okay too. Then what do we do? Wait and see, <laughs> right? Wait and see. <laughs> Until we are sure which way the divine will is moving, then we will wait. We don't need to artificially, um, you know, take something up or move in a particular direction. It's okay to wait and see if we're unsure. And, and in the meantime, just go on chanting, hearing and chanting, Shravan, Kirtan, trying to take Sadhu Sangha when we can, you know, just to continue with that process. You know, that's, that's really the essence of everything anyway. You know, so, so to maintain, to preserve, what we have, that we should not take that lightly. That's not a small thing. And if that's the best we can do, we're doing pretty good. <laughs> we're doing very well. <laughs> and, and, you know, we, we, it's, also, it's also a matter of faith, you know, like we may feel alone sometimes. We may feel neglected sometimes, but we're not. We have to have the faith that our guardians are real and they do care about us and they are there. We have to, we have, to have that faith. And so if we are in a state of uncertainty, if we feel, oh, they're not showing me the path clearly right now, then we must think there's some purpose behind that. There's a reason for that. And to, to humbly accept that and try to go on day by day with what we have, which is not a little thing either. Yeah, I should have been Dave. <laughs> those, are, those are my thoughts on that. No, thank you so much. Very, uh, very enlightening. <laughs> That's what the Guru said, it needs strong faith. The Guru told many times, we have to have strong faith. So thank you so much. Yeah, I've been through so many kind of things. So <laughs> it uh, helps me so much. Thank you, Vishakari. I'm so happy <laughs> with your association. And you are a stalwart disciple of Gurudev. <laughs> I've seen so many, even sannyasis fall away, but you have so much affection with Gurudev. So that, that's very rare. <laughs> well, thank you for bringing up such a important topic. Thank you so much. Jai Shri Bhakti Sundar Govinda Dev Goswami Maharaj Ki Jai. All the assembled devotees Ki Jai. Thank you all so much for your wonderful association and service opportunity. And hope we can meet again next week. Jai Vishaka Devi Dasi Ki Jai. 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 Jai.